Welcome everyone to Tales from the Trenches, a series that Matter is producing together with Village MD. Uh, my name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter, and we are a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub built on a belief that collaboration between entrepreneurs and industry leaders is the best way to develop healthcare solutions. Today's program is part of our Tales from the Trenches series, uh, which we uh, where we feature accomplished healthcare entrepreneurs sharing their stories and what they've learned along their entrepreneurial journeys. We produce this series with Village MD, which for those of you who aren't familiar, is a Chicago-based company that is innovating in value-based care. Uh, they recently announced a billion dollar investment from Walgreens. They're now operating in nine markets uh, with more than a thousand clinics. Um, our guest today is Todd Park, who has really one of the most incredible resumes of any healthcare technology innovator I've met. Uh, Todd is the co-founder and executive chairman of Devoted Health, which is focused on Medicare Advantage. Um, he previously founded uh, Athena Health, as well as Castlight Health. He was the chief technology officer for the United States under President Obama from 2012 to 2014. Uh, and held that position in the Department of Health and Human Services from 2009 to 2012. Uh, moderating the conversation uh, today is Paul Martino, who is the co-founder and chief growth officer of Village MD. Uh, prior to starting the company, he was a senior vice president uh, and held a number of leadership roles at Anthem and WellPoint. Um, and he's been in the healthcare industry uh, for more than 30 years. And with that, Paul, I hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Stephen, and appreciate the, the time today. And um, for those of you in the audience, Stephen was very kind. It's not more than 30 years in healthcare. It's actually approaching 40. So um, don't hold that against me. Todd, <clears throat> great as always to see you. Where are you this morning, this afternoon? Uh, Northern California, Northern California. How about yourself? I am uh, in, in a hotel room in the fine town of Atlanta, Hotlanta, as they call it, right? Awesome. So uh, it's beautiful here. I hope it's beautiful there. Rumor has it it's beautiful in Chicago. So maybe we can, uh, we can open up the discussion by uh, you just talking a little bit about who you are and how did you get here, uh, meaning the formative years, and then we're going to get into your entrepreneurial track. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's incredibly exciting to be here uh, and uh, always wonderful, Paul, to be talking with you and to be talking with uh, entrepreneurs and innovators who are working to make healthcare better. That is my favorite, favorite, favorite group of people in the world. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, background briefly in terms of uh, journey is that uh, uh, I was uh, born to uh, immigrants who came to the United States from, from South Korea in the late 60s to study. Um, I was a mistake. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, my parents welcomed me into the world uh, and then decided to uh, build, uh, build a family here in the United States. Um, two years after I was born, my brother Ed uh, was born. Uh, one of the most important events in my life <laughs> across multiple dimensions uh, because Ed is the most amazing brother ever. And uh, we were really raised in a small town in Ohio. Um, and uh, that's really uh, that's really the upbringing that that shaped us and our values and our whole thought and and heart pattern. Um, then uh, uh, basically went to college, uh, got interested in health, uh, health care, health economics in college. Um, got a job as a management consultant, uh, working on uh, managed care, health care innovation. Uh, right out of college, uh, where I met um, Jonathan Bush. Uh, who became um, a small friend. personality. Uh, you small personality. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he and I were Cub Scout consultants together uh, working on the uh, infant Booz Allen and Hamilton managed care team. So we spent more time with each other than we spent with our significant others um, and uh, can fell deeply in professional love with each other. Uh, and, uh, and then decided um, roping in my brother, Ed. And when he, uh, Jonathan was 27, I was 24, it was 22. And therefore just didn't know better. <laughs> Who decided to start a company? Because <laughs> yeah. we hadn't gotten the memo about what you really shouldn't try to do, right? When you know nothing. Um, but uh, we uh, we we uh, we started a company called Athena Health um, that uh, was focused on dramatically improving maternity care. I'm um, starting with the engine. How'd and you put maternity? What 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 made you think that that would be a good place to start? Yeah, so the inspiration was really Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's wife, 
uh, Sarah Bush, who was studying to be a certified nurse midwife in the public health system of New York City. Um, and she would just, you know, whenever we could actually hang out with her, which was relatively rarely because <laughs> we were working nonstop, she would, uh, she would just tell the stories, right, about how maternity care worked or actually more to the point didn't work from her perspective. Uh, and that got us to really diving into maternity care in America and understanding at a systemic level uh, why it worked and why it didn't work uh, and seeing a massive opportunity to help it be better. Um, and Athena Health's original model was actually to be a value-based care provider using present day parlance uh, by taking global epistolic risk um, and uh, uh, applying a really a collaborative medical home for mom type model uh, where an integrated team of physician, midwife, social worker, educator, nutrition, social worker uh, could love on a mom proactively to get them the right care place, right time, such that actually complications dropped way down, hospitalization uh, complications, uh, uh, NICU stays dropped way down, um, such that uh, outcomes improved and, and, and costs were reduced. And so that was the whole point. So it was it. working. The point is it was working. It, it, it was working. And, and in fact, uh, uh, what, we, uh, what we ended up doing um, was to get the company going, we um, uh, bought a very successful collaborative care practice in San Diego, California. Um, one of the leading practitioners of collaborative care, the collaborative care model for, for moms-to-be in the country um, and started running it. Um, and the whole idea was to then systematize that and then export that across the country. Um, and things did not did not go according to plan. <laughs> well, say more about that. They never do. And we've they got lots yeah. of out there. So what would tell say more? Yeah. So basically, uh, you know, first of all, um, you know, look, you know, I was 24, right? You know, um, and uh, I managed to convince a health system to sell us this practice: 150 person, 25 midwife, seven OB practice. Um, 13 offices across San Diego, California, right? Um, I thought I was like the greatest deal maven of all time, right? Turns out, no. <laughs> it turns out that yeah, basically, uh, you know, this health system was extremely eager uh, to sell this practice uh, because running on its own two feet, uh, it turns out that it was losing a lot of money, uh, which was so obscured by kind of the complex finances of it when embedded inside a health system. But when it was running on its own two feet, it, it was losing a lot of money. Um, and uh, that gradually became apparent to us as the revenue we were collecting didn't match the, <laughs> the revenue we thought we were supposed to be getting. <laughs> uh, and it would actually all have been fixed if we in fact had been able to get global risk contracts with payers. Um, and we went to payers and said, look, we have the superior model, uh, take whatever you've been spending historically on cost per pregnancy and cut 10% off, right? And just book 10% savings, pay us this global episodic payment and we'll handle it from there. And um, what we discovered was that payers said, look, I believe your model is better. Um, I believe that you know, you're delivering on it um, and can deliver on it um, and can continue to deliver on it, but I'm not gonna change the way I pay just for you, right? Um, I, I'm not gonna actually alter how I pay for healthcare for you. Uh, and so no. Um, and so a practice that actually would have been doing very, very well under a global episodic risk payment uh, model while delivering significant savings to the healthcare system uh, as it grew, um, just became a really unviable independent medical practice um, losing like a million dollars a year. Um, and so that's what uh, Jonathan, Ed and I were left with um, and what then happened was we said, okay, look, right, you know, this is a huge portion of the public health safety net for women in San Diego, right? We're not going to be the captains on the ship when this ship goes down, right? We will not actually be at the helm responsible <laughs> for this ending. And so we're going to actually pull all the stops and fight with everything in our power to make sure that we save this practice. Uh, and so we first said, okay, well, there's no software running these doctor's offices. That's crazy. So let's go get software to run these doctor's offices. Um, we looked at 400 literally different practice management billing systems, 
they were all terrible and none of them were internet-based. This is 1998. So we said, okay, well, this is a really crazy situation. We're just going to build our own. Um, so we ended up building the first internet-based, cloud-based software platform to run doctor's offices in the way that we wanted to run them. We integrated a billing service into it and combined the software and this next generation billing service to net net cut the cost of billing in half, uh, radically increase speed of payment and cut bad debt um, and did that to basically just save this practice. Um, what then happened um, is, to make an incredibly long story short, is that the doctors and midwives uh, who we were working for, working with, said to us, as we were thinking about the future of the business, they said, you know, Todd and Ed and Jonathan, you're lovely young people, right? Um, but, you know, running medical offices isn't exactly your strong suit. Like you're okay at it, but not particularly good at it, right? Uh, and, you know- Don't you hate when they do that? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, yeah, you could go buy more of these practices and run them. But again, like, why would you do that? Because you're not particularly great at it. Um, but the software and this billing service that you built is incredible, right? It is actually taking our biggest single hassle, which is wrestling with insurance companies and making that wrestling go away and giving us the time and the emotional energy and the financial resources to really focus on what we love to do, which is care for patients. So we suggest that as you think about expanding and working with our sisters and brothers in medicine, that you drop the whole run the practices thing <laughs> and instead provide your software <laughs> and your billing service as a suite of services to help people rock and roll. Um, and, and truthfully, it took me a long time to get there. Like my brain got there in like five seconds, right? My heart took a lot longer to get there because my office was in one of our birth centers where we could hear a baby being born every 78 hours through the ventilation system. And, and I loved being that close to care, right? I loved actually being in the middle of care. So did you feel like you were copping out by just pursuing and you were giving up on the actual patient care side of it? Um, I, 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 I did, uh, you know, I think emotionally, um, and, uh, and, um, I said, look, you know, I, I want to be in the beta business, right? Not a dot communist medical billing service, right? You know, um, uh, but, uh, I, 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 I eventually through a lot of conversations with the midwives and the doctors got to the place where I realized that our mission of helping healthcare make the way it should, uh, making healthcare work the way it should, um, uh, was actually best fulfilled by us if we did the thing that we could do that was most helpful to the doctors and midwives, right? Which is supplier software, supplier billing service, help inject temporal, financial, emotional energy into their lives so they could be the best they could be. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, you know, we have in our Athena archives like 26 versions of our first VC pitch, right? And it starts with, uh, you know, baby company, right? And it ends with dot communist medical billing, uh, you know, and software company. Um, and then there's these like really weird variations in between <laughs> as we were like neither fish nor fowl and some kind of combination of the two. Um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, eventually I realized that that this was the way that we could be most helpful. And so we transmogrified right into a software as a service and billing service company, um, and then attracted a bunch of venture capital and then just took off from there. And so then say, a little, we, say a little bit about that, Todd, because this group that's, that's probably listening and or at least a portion of them are all thinking about capital, access to capital. How do I do it? What, how did you think about it when you were starting Athena? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, <laughs> when you're first time entrepreneur, right. I mean, you know, it's, uh, just, I mean, bluntly, right? I mean, it's a uh, it's an exercise uh, suffused by sheer terror most of the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you like to think that you're cool and calm and collected and strategic. And they're going to buy this story. <laughs> and, 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 and really, really, anyone who says that that's how they did it, right, either got incredibly lucky or is just in a massive fit of self-deception, right? And so we, uh, you know, basically had this idea. We thought it was a pretty good idea. We raised angel money. Uh, we bought this practice, uh, got parachuted in the middle, right, of a giant firefight, then fought like hell to get out of the firefight, right? Building software, building services to get ourselves out of the firefight, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and we were just focused on, focused really on just surviving, honestly, right? Uh, and building something of true value. Uh, and, um, you know, once we actually crystallized that we had built something that was truly helpful, 
Um, and once our minds and hearts aligned that that's what we really wanted to do, um, we then actually uh, did begin to engage uh, venture capitalists. Um, and um, uh, that was a very interesting process. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, I think that probably the best way to distill it is that, um, let me put it this way. So the, the, the lead investor in our initial venture capital round is a guy named Brian Roberts um, from Venrock. He was an associate at the time. Um, he uh, did an incredible amount of due diligence on us, uh, 19 rounds total, because I count every time he called me back as another round, right? He's the only VC who went to one of the medical offices to actually watch people use the software um, and did an enormous amount of research. And then he, as a young associate, went to the partnership at Venrock and said, I think we should invest in this company, Athena Health. And the partnership said, you're crazy, right? You want to invest in a, in a, in a, in a health care IT company, right? I mean, that's just a wasteland of epic proportions, right? And you want to invest with, 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 with who, right? Basically, like these, these are kids, like they've run laps in their life, but really nothing else, right? I mean, if you add up Jonathan and Todd's age collectively, that equals like the age of an acceptable CEO, right? So the, the, the Venrock partnership said like, no. And Brian went back and did more due diligence and came back and said, um, I actually think this is a bet that we should, we should make. I think this is actually uh, something that could be really, really big. And the Venrock partnership said, well, okay, kid, it's on your head, right? We're only doing this because you're putting your entire career on the line uh, to invest in this company. Uh, Brian's first investment was Illumina. His second investment was Athena. Uh, he's now the managing partner of Venrock. <laughs> he's going to uh, say he's done okay. He's done okay, right? Yeah, uh, he's, yeah, he's one of the most right. successful American healthcare VCs of all time. Um, but the, the moral of the story is that we were really not an obvious bet. We were really, really, really not, right? Um, and Brian saw something in us. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what, <laughs> but he saw something in us and what we had done because our software was a really basic prototype at the time, right? You know, I mean, and, and so, you know, and, and, and our whole setup was in an incredibly primordial state. Um, but he saw something that he believed in and decided to bet his career on. Um, and I think that's what truly great venture capitalists really do. Um, and it turned out, it turned out to be, it turned out to be a, a great bet. Um, so so you, you, you get in the company going, you've got a guy that's willing to bet on you, a guy that's willing to risk his career on you. The company's getting going, the company's taking off. And then eventually there's got to be the seminal moment where you collectively say, maybe we should take the company public. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was another, it's another interesting, interesting uh, discussion set. So, you know, we spent, uh, you know, really, you know, better part of a decade, right. As a private company, uh, we spent a long time as a private company, right. By, by, by a lot of standards. Um, and we were just really methodically focused on building the business. Um, we added an electronic health record, which thrilled us because we, we get, we then got, back closer to clinical care, we added patient communications um, and uh, uh, other new software and services that basically got us closer and closer uh, again to, to, to clinical care um, and uh, just help further our mission of helping make healthcare work the way it should. Um, we actually, frankly, weren't thinking a lot, right, about, about an IPO at all. Um, uh, uh, and, um, um, you know, it, 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 it then became a thing that we began to think about, right, um, as a way to actually really um, increase our profile, right, build our brand, right, among the, the, the doctor universe, um, uh, gain capital to be able to continue to rock and roll. Um, but it wasn't something that we ever viewed in kind of, uh, what's the word? Um, it's something that was disproportionately important be honest with you, right? Um, it wasn't, it, it was or wasn't disproportionately important. It was not, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it was not something that we ever really viewed as disproportionately important. It, it wasn't the end point. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a particular gate through which to travel um, and then keep doing the work. Um, so, um, so, you know, we, we, we just didn't, we just didn't, we didn't treat it as an epochal company transforming thing. In fact, we very much hoped it would be, it would, it would not be <laughs> company transforming. We were extremely worried about what it might do to the culture and execution pattern of the company uh, if we, if we were a public company. Um, and so, uh, and so we spent a bunch of time thinking through that. Uh, and I think as we prepared very assiduously for that, um, being public didn't really change the fundamental character 
and and an orientation of Athena, which was which was great. Um, uh, but you know, it, 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 it was it was it was it was it was it was also a bit of a surreal process, actually, right? I mean, so we. Um, I mean, there's a whole bunch I can say about that, right? But but I mean, you know, we were we were we were flying around the country, right? You know, in in the in a, in, a, in in these private jets, right? And we were, Jonathan and I were saying to ourselves, like, we don't want to pay for this. Like, why why are we in these why are we in these jets, right? You know. Um, Just so and, we're clear, row one twenty three, seat B is where I still sit on Great United Airlines. So just so exactly. you know. <laughs> exactly right you know um and, and so uh and so you know we 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 uh, we we just uh, you know the, the, the process was just just weird for us because we we were sitting in like the middle seat right of yeah. of yeah. united airlines right and so right. um and uh um you know and then we went we went we went we went public actually um on the nasdaq and uh you know obviously it's a that's a virtual market right but there's a show site in times square Right. Then right. you saw like Athena Health's banner up on this giant kind of cylindrical electronic billboard, and we got walked into this conference room uh, for watching us start trading at eleven o'clock. Um, and um, uh, you know, we we waited for that moment um, with dread, actually, honestly, right? Um, and uh, and then our stock started trading, um, and um, the price was way the heck above what our IPO price was. And we said, well, we're in the wrong room, clearly, right? This is not our stock, right? This is someone else's stock. <laughs> right. um, and, and the NASDAQ thing patiently explained to us that it was in fact our stock. Um, and, uh, and the company ended up being worth like well over a billion dollars, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, which yeah. again, just was really weird to us. Like all of this was really, really strange. Yeah. Um, and what we wanted to do more than anything was just say, okay, great. Like we're through this particular portal, we're through this particular milestone and we're just gonna get back to work. Um, and, uh, and and keep working our hearts out, right? To build something that's truly useful um, and help doctors and nurses like be the best they can be. So, so this is uh, the first part of your professional journey. I, I want to get back to your family in a minute, but before that, let's keep going on the professional. So then, you're 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 now a public company. You're a highly successful company, <laughs> much like uh, you said. You know, you think you got it wrong. That can't be about us. <laughs> Whose company is that? I know exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. And so then, what happened? You decided uh, to leave, or what? What happened? Yeah, so uh, I stayed with Athena for another year uh, to basically make sure that the culture uh, wouldn't change, hadn't changed. Uh, and after a year, I was convinced that the culture actually had not been fundamentally changed um, by being a public company. Um, and so at that point, um, I decided to keep a longstanding promise I made my wife and, uh, and stay married. Um, <laughs> Good idea. Uh, by, by, by retiring from Athena and, and, uh, uh, and staying on its board, uh, but then actually uh, moving uh, from Boston to, to here, to Northern California. Because uh, I, I met my wife when we were 17 and I promised her that um, we would raise a family near her mom and dad uh, here in Northern California. And Athena Health is based in, in Boston. And my wife would, would, would repeatedly remind me, particularly during the nine months of Boston that are really cold, um, that Boston is not Northern California. <laughs> and when are we going to Northern California? Um, and so I finally decided to keep my promise and we, we moved to Northern California. Um, and I stayed connected right to my first professional child, Athena. Uh, and to this day, love her desperately. Um, but we had a baby, my, my wife and I, an actual baby, as opposed to the professional baby, that was Athena, um, Alex. Um, and Amy was happy for the first time really ever, I think, uh, with me uh, at fundamental level. Um, uh, along the way, um, I got persuaded uh, by another close friend, Giovanni Villala, um, and Brian Roberts to start a second company called Castlight Health. Um, very, very exciting uh, concept. Um, uh, to bring uh, transparency uh, to the healthcare shopping experience and create an online benefit management platform uh, for healthcare uh, that could be incredibly powerful. Um, uh, but I helped start Castlight, but it mostly got built by other people uh, because a year and a half into being in California and my wife being happy, and I got drafted <laughs> by, by the by the U.S. government, um, and uh, and then made probably the most unexpected transition of my. Of my of my professional life, um, uh, which I can, I'm happy to talk more about. Um, yeah, so, just a, a, a quick question, and then I do want to get into that because uh, not often do 24 year old kids, 22 year old kids, 
ride this up, get this level of success, move to California, and a year and a half later, get tapped on the shoulder. But before we go there, uh, where was Ed all this time? You said that was the mo one of the most important days in your life. Where did he go? What happened with Ed? Yeah, so Ed uh, was the founding engineer at Athena. Um, and uh, um, uh, was still at Athena um, and stayed with Athena like for the better part of another decade, actually, another full decade, actually, um, uh, after I retired from the manager team. Um, and uh, he's just the most extraordinary person. He's just the most extraordinary person. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to Devoted uh, in a bit, right? But yeah. a major yeah. motivation for me uh, in starting Devoted was the opportunity to reunite with my brother and work with him again, because um, he's just the most incredible, incredible human being. So we'll, we will come back to that. So, so you get a tap, a phone call, I imagine. And what, what was, what, what happened? How did that even come about? Um, so, um, so uh, can, the, the long story short is that, um, like uh, many, 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 many other Americans, um, I got involved in politics as a citizen for the first time. Uh, because of the 2008 presidential election um, and uh, uh, was uh, uh, doing everything I could um, on behalf of um, Senator Obama's presidential campaign. Um, then, uh, uh, then Senator Obama became President-elect Obama. Um, and I said, okay, this is great. Like I am no longer going to be involved in politics. <laughs> you know, the mission I believe in has been, has been executed. This is awesome, right? And um, I was there in Chicago on election night. Um, I remember President-elect Obama coming out and everyone else was delirious with excitement um, in that park, except for him. <laughs> he was incredibly sober. And he said something that I will never forget, um, which uh, he said far more eloquently than I'm gonna relate it uh, now. Uh, but the gestalt was, uh, look, all this is great but we actually haven't done anything yet. Like whether we actually are able to be truly helpful to the country um, is uh, a function of what we decide to do going forward. And it's really not a function of me. It's a function of all of you and whether you continue to dedicate yourselves to and sacrifice for change. Uh, and remember not being able to, not being able to sleep that night um, and, uh, and thinking that of course he was right um, and so the next day, I just basically called someone and said, look, you know, I would be delighted to help in any way I possibly can. Um, I cannot move from California, right? I'm going to get divorced if I do. Um, I cannot come to DC. But if I can help in any, any, any small way, I'd be delighted to help. And so um, I got put in touch with a think tank called the Center for American Progress, uh, which was doing a lot of work uh, to be helpful to the Obama administration um, in DC. And I became a you know, part-time volunteer senior fellow. Um, and then I got poached. <laughs> so I got poached, um, and 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 uh, and I, I would I'll just say the Obama administration is a phenomenal recruiter. <laughs> They're relentless, incredibly focused, and they do not take no for an answer. Um, and so I got asked uh, to um, uh, to take on a new role called CTO of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, with the role so, of so there was not that role previously. There wasn't. There was someone who was called the CTO, but <clears throat> who was working for someone called the CIO, who was running all the internal tech at, a at HHS. But this was a new job that wasn't focused on the internal tech of HHS. Um, it was focused um, on um, basically being a policy advisor to the secretary and deputy secretary on how to craft policy and evolve policy uh, to help um, basically catalyze uh, uh, tech and data and innovation to make healthcare better. Um, so they called it their entrepreneur in residence uh, job, a, a different kind of EIR, right? Uh, but you know, their EIR, right? Uh, and uh, um, I initially said, no, I can't do it. I can't, I can't move from California, right? Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and come to DC to do this. Um, but they were, they were incredibly persuasive. And what they really actually uh, got me with was, I asked, well, what, what, what would you want this person to do? And they said, well, like, we're sitting on the acres and acres and acres and acres, cubic hectares, cubic miles of data, right? And CMS and FDA, NIH, CDC. And we don't get the sense that we're actually um, basically maximizing 
uh, social return on taxpayer investment in this data. So we'd love for you to come and figure out what to do with this data, right? Um, and I kind of delved into that and said, oh, wow, right? I mean, they knew exactly how to get me, which is to ensorcel me with a catnip of data, right? They can generate huge value. Yeah. Um, and so I, I remember then like flying back and, and talking to Amy um, and saying the thought, maybe we should go to DC. Um, and then she didn't talk to me for, for four days. Yeah, uh, smooth conversation, so, easy, right? No, no friction there. <laughs> but I'll never forget what she said after after four days of not talking to me, which was, uh, if they're really creating a job like that, she said, it's your national duty to go do that job. Um, I said, well, I, I can't go without you and Alex. She said, I'll go back to the East Coast, which I don't like, away from my parents with the baby, right, for a year, so we can actually serve serve the country, serve the country together. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, both Amy and I, uh, as children of immigrants um, and who've experienced uh, an extraordinary adventure here in the United States, I mean, at the end of the day, right, you know, this country has given, given me and given her everything, everything. Um, and in no other country is our life, is our story possible. And so... Uh, ultimately, when our country asks us to serve, of course, we would drop everything. And of course, we would do that. Of course, we would do that. Um, uh, and so we did. Uh, now, that ended up actually being seven years. <laughs> and Amy signed up for one. So you, um, stayed in, you stayed in D.C. seven years on a... <laughs> for, for, five, for five years, and then basically served the last two years of my duty in public service um, in, uh, from Silicon Valley, but was shuttling back and forth constantly. So Amy doesn't really consider that being home. Um, and so, so that was longer than Amy bargained for, right? But, uh, but it, it was still, uh, you know, um, like, she, you know, it, it, I would definitely say, right? The most extraordinary professional experience of my life, right? And she would say one of the most extraordinary experiences of our family's life and really, really, really deeply, deeply, deeply meaningful. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I started this job of HHS CTO and um, uh, you know, the initial hypothesis that HHS had was uh, you know, basically monetized from a social value standpoint, um, this data by uh, having HHS build a bunch of apps that utilize data. I said, well, you could do that, right? But that's not necessarily the right way to go here. <laughs> Why don't we actually do what the US government did with weather data and GPS back in the day, right? By taking these public resources, then opening them up um, for everyone else to use. So all the other smart people in the world can combine the data with their data and their knowledge and their capabilities to come up with new insights and services and products um, that uh, you know, HS wouldn't even have thought up, let alone like have the resource to be able to build and promulgate and scale. Um, and so we launched an initiative, uh, the Health Data Initiative to open up this data. Um, and we started an event called the Health Data Palooza. <laughs> um, to, uh, yeah, 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 to, uh, beautiful. To basically promulgate, publicize the data and people are doing with it. Um, and the thing just took off um, like, uh, like wildfire. Uh, and uh, after two years, they said, okay, this thing is now out of control in a great way, right? Uh, it doesn't need me anymore. It's off to the races and I'm gonna make my wife happy and go home. A year late, right? But still like two years, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and make her happy again. Um, and then the White House called and said, um, we'd like you to actually do the same job you've been doing at HHS, but now do it for uh, President Obama across all domains um, as, as, the, as the US CTO. Um, and I said, no, basically uh, for like six months. Um, but they are, because I really want to stay married. <laughs> and uh, so that was the little thing in the way. Yeah, that was a small thing in the way. Right. But again, kind of long story short, the White House is a relentless and incredibly focused and effective recruiter um, uh, and convinced Amy and me to, to stay um, until the end of the first term. Um, and, uh, uh, and then President Obama asked me and more importantly, Amy, uh, to extend further. And so we did. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, the, 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 that, that experience was just incredible, incredible, you know, and, and I, I don't want to make the job sound like too grandiose. I mean, a, 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 a title like CTO of the United States, like sounds a little grandiose. I mean, so 
Um, actually, when I, when I got appointed, my friends would call me and say, I hear you're the CTO of the United States. I'm an American. My Xbox is broken. Can you help me fix it? <laughs> I said, well, I'll try, right? So, um, I'll send the cable guy over. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, but, but really, the job was to be uh, President Obama's uh, personal geek in residence and tech policy advisor, right? And so, um, so the, the job was to work on tech policy issues like internet policy, net neutrality, uh, wireless spectrum allocation, you know, entrepreneurship policy. Um, and, and, and these are issues that many people might find a bit of a snoozer, right? You know, but, but President Obama and I loved this stuff <laughs> and have a chance to work with a president who loves this stuff, right? Because uh, it's very high leverage policy stuff, right? It was just incredible, right? Working on open data across multiple domains, not just healthcare. Um, and so it was just an extraordinary experience. Um, uh, but I would say probably the most meaningful uh, a portion of that experience, um, and certainly the most stressful and intense, um, had nothing to do with tech policy. Um, it was when, um, on October 1st, 2013, the federally facilitated health insurance marketplace, um, healthcare.gov, went live um, and uh, went incredibly badly. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, CMS, the agency um, in, in charge of healthcare.gov, uh, was working its heart out to try to fix it. Um, work, sorry, working its heart out to try to fix it. Um, you know, Hopefully that's not the White House. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, um, uh, the progress was not, was, not, was not moving at a rapid clip. And so, um, uh, so President Obama asked me and um, my teammate Jeff Science if we would lead a uh, turnaround mission, basically. Um, to go to CMS and work with them to seek to fix the, the, the website. Um, so uh, recruited a set of uh, intrepid teammates and then went in. Um, and uh, that is a whole other story, which we get into. Uh, but kind of long story short, uh, in six weeks, uh, we working with CMS were able to take the website from enrolling uh, just a small number of people a day in health insurance to enrolling over 100,000 people a day um, in health insurance. Um, and then by the end of the open enrollment period, um, uh, enrolled 1.5 million more people in healthcare than uh, even the most optimistic projection had projected uh, even for the site um, had such a terrible start. Um, and so uh, it, it was a ridiculously stressful and intense experience um, and also profoundly Profoundly meaningful, profoundly meaningful um, uh, to basically you know keep team spirits up and and just motivate just the endless amount of backbreaking work twenty four seven to actually get the site fixed and then to actually further reinforce it so that it would actually hold uh, when most Americans came at the last second to enroll at the end of enrollment uh, we would read letters um, that people had written the president um, uh, thanking. Um, thanking him for saving their life uh, mm -hmm. by connecting them to healthcare, you know, uh, and uh, and it was those stories of Americans' lives who were saved and transformed um, that really was the fuel that enabled us to just keep running right incredibly high speed um, to to fix this thing. Um, so then, uh, uh, after coming home. Mm -hmm. uh, to my regular job um, from the uh, Fix Healthcare.gov mission, um, I actually kind of found it hard to focus again on like net neutrality, <laughs> et cetera, as exciting as that stuff is. And so uh, President Obama and I and uh, a few other intrepid souls um, co-founded a new elite tech special forces unit of the US government called the US Digital Service, inspired by the rescue healthcare.gov. And the whole idea was to get um, uh, maybe a few dozen additional people um, uh, who were fantastic technologists, engineers, product managers, designers, to come do two to four year tours of duty uh, working for the US Digital Service, kind of like a Peace Corps for geeks, right? That we then send in small teams across the Pentagon, the VA, right, the Immigration Service, you know, et cetera, uh, to uh, reboot, transform, upgrade, um, uh, uh, tech-enabled services delivered by the U.S. government. 
Um, we thought, you know, maybe a few dozen other people, right, would actually leave their multi-million dollar stock options packages at Google and come do this. Um, uh, working in the heart, right, of the VA, uh, doing incredibly difficult work. Um, but in a signal of the fundamental goodness of human beings, um, about 200 people actually signed up to cut. Um, and the US Digital Service uh, became uh, hugely impactful um, across a bunch of domains and the US government, uh, improving service for citizens, improving national defense, et cetera. Um, and actually was enthusiastically continued in the Trump administration and continues now in the Biden administration and has become a, a, a really increasingly powerful axis uh, of improvement in how our government actually functions and delivers. And so, um, and so that, 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 was, that, was, that was an incredible experience as well. Um, and uh, so then basically five years into being in DC, um, my wife came to me and it's when your life partner speaks quietly to you, uh, when she speaks in a quiet voice, that's when you have to pay the most attention, right? So- yeah, I get that too. Yeah. yeah, you said, look, you know, we've been here five years. Um, I am now returning home with our now two children. And I invite you to, to, to come with me if you wish to be my husband on a going forward basis. <laughs> uh, and I said, oh, I, I do wish to be your husband on a go forward basis. Um, and uh, um, um, I then had a 40 minute conversation with, with, with President Obama uh, in the Oval uh, where he was saying, you know, Todd, you, you can't go. You cannot go. You need to be here with me till the very end. And I said, I would, I would, I would love, I would love that. I would love that, but I'm going to get beheaded and divorced <laughs> or divorced and beheaded. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we, we, we talked for a while, uh, and he, he then finally said, okay, Todd, I want you to stay married. Uh, and I love Amy. I want her to be happy. Um, and so I'll let you go home as long as you agree to keep working for me from there. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, um, he figured out a way to basically create this position of White House tech advisor based in Silicon Valley. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I took that, um, that role and kept working for him uh, for the next uh, two years until the end of the, uh, two plus years until the end of the second term. Because uh, what we really wanted me to do was keep building the US Digital Service uh, and keep recruiting more people to come join uh, the US Digital Service and also help on other issues where it was very useful for me to be in Silicon Valley. Um, and I, 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 I was able to stay married because, in fact, did technically move home with my wife. Um, uh, but I was in D.C. constantly um, because you just have to be um, in, in that kind of work. And so Amy doesn't really count uh, that period as me being home. Uh, but she did give me enough credit to not divorce me. <laughs> um, and so there's a question from from the audience that's talking about innovation and people generally don't think of you know governments innovating uh and and what has happened is has been amazing in healthcare and i think it will continue to do amazing things in healthcare you know the folks and we know the folks and i think the innovation will continue and so the question is how do you how do you balance the public private partnerships to drive more innovation and then a follow on question how do you know which partners to trust, right? You were an innovator. You started an organization. Brian Roberts bet on you. You bet on Ben Rock. That worked out. You're in the government. And then I want to get to devoted. Yeah. So, um, uh, so such an interesting question. There's so many different angles one could, could take with that. Um, I think that um, uh, with respect to... Um, uh, I'll come at it through, through, through two different lenses. So... When it comes to the government facilitating private sector innovation, um, the technique that I found that worked the best was open innovation, right? So in other words, like, you know, it's not the government going out and recruiting particular partners to do particular things, although that I suppose could work as well, depending on what it is you're doing. It's more the government actually creating a platform on which innovation can happen that's accessible to everyone, right? So. Uh, making weather data available, making GPS available, making uh, uh, you know all kinds of uh, scientific biomedical data and uh, uh, other kinds of healthcare system and public health related data available um, to everyone, um, such that anyone can grab it and then anyone can actually ideate and dream with it and combine it with other ingredients to create something amazing. Um, 
Um, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's a wonderful law called Joy's Law that was coined by uh, Bill Joy, uh, who founded Sun Microsystems. And uh, Joy's Law states this, um, no matter who you are, you have to remember that most of the smartest people in the world do not work for you. <laughs> they work for other people or work for themselves, right? And so a phenomenal recipe, I think, um, for innovation is to keep Joy's Law in mind and say, if you do this government, right, you know, sure, you've got like a ton of smart people at NIH and CDC and CMS, et cetera, right? But um, the thing that would be much more impactful by orders of magnitude uh, is to not just have your own smart people using your data to do stuff, but to open up your data and your knowledge so that all the other smart people in the world who vastly outnumber you um, can actually innovate on that basis. And so I'm a huge fan of of the public sector creating platforms for innovation and then facilitating open innovation. Um, with respect to um, uh, innovation inside the government uh, to do things like create uh, like this platform for innovation and uh, create the US digital service, et cetera. Um, what, what I found is that um, it's interesting because I was, I was interviewed by federal news radio uh, you know, early on in my tenure in the US government and um, they're asking like, you know, can you describe kind of what it's like, right? To be an entrepreneur, like now working uh, as a bureaucrat. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, actually it's, 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 it's pretty similar uh, because uh, I've been asked to assume the role of a, of a change agent. Um, and what I found is that, um, you know, the recipe uh, for making change happen in the public sector is actually very similar to making change happen as an entrepreneur. Meaning you come up with an idea, um, you recruit a terrific team, uh, you basically try that idea to a sufficient degree to understand what works about what doesn't work about it. You refine it, right? And then you raise additional capital, whether it be human capital to join the effort or political capital to advance the idea or financial capital to fund the idea. Um, and you iterate it um, and take it to the next level, right? And then, uh, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then you know, keep, keep raising more rounds of various kinds of capital um, and, uh, and, and grow the phenomenon from there. Um, and, uh, and I remember the, the interviewer saying, well, you know, so is, is changing government like that easy? Uh, you know, like, 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 like building a company. <laughs> I said, well, just to be clear, building a company is unbelievably hard. <laughs> so change in yes, all, it is. all dimensions, all sectors is unbelievably hard, right? But but there's a pattern um, that is, uh, is, 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 is one that is uh, more likely to lead to success if you adopt it, that is common across, across both. So take us to Devoted. You're, you're eventually stepping out of the government uh, and then you have an idea. Yeah, um, so, um, so uh, um, I, uh, I, I stepped, out of public service in January, 2017. And um, uh, my wife had uh, made us buy a six week uh, vacation overseas um, to uh, pre-buy it like a year prior to guarantee that I would actually leave. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and so I uh, spent six weeks just reconnecting with my family uh, and, uh, and, and, and resting uh, deeply. Um, and uh, you know, I had I had I had an incredible clear thought, um, which was um, uh, I, I wanted to start what became devoted, uh, and I wanted to work with my brother again. I wanted to work with Brian Roberts um, and uh, Bob Kocher um, and Ben Rock um, again, and um, uh, and I had a very clear sense of what the mission of the company would be. Um, like an incredibly clear sense of what the mission of the company would be. And this is one of the, 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 the downsides actually, if you can call it that, of public service, is that once you work on public service scale missions with the depth of meaning of public service missions, it sets a whole new bar for what meaningful work really is, right? Um, and so we had this phenomenon where US digital service um, engineers and product managers and designers would go back to their previous job that they had thought was doing something really important. Um, and they just didn't think it was that important anymore. <laughs> and so, um, and so um, devoted, risk, isn't it? what's that? It's a big risk. Um, yeah. and, and so, you know, but, but on the other hand, like, you know, uh, you know, I loved, 
I love having that high of a bar, right? Like I, I, I love actually uh, being exposed to work of that depth of meaning and scale, right? Because it really does challenge you to then keep doing work at that level of meaning and scale, right? And not settle for anything less because life is short. You don't know how long you have on this earth, right? So you, you, you might as well go flat out and, and, and do as much as you can to be as helpful as you can. Um, and so Javod's mission was the only mission I could think of that didn't feel like a letdown <laughs> after public service. Um, and, uh, and the mission was to dramatically improve the health and well-being of seniors to start eventually everyone in America to start, I mean, eventually, you know, go everywhere by caring for each and every person like they're literally our own family. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that, that, that impulse to care for everyone like their own family wasn't a slogan that our marketing department invented after the fact to make it sound awesome. Like that was the whole reason why Ed and I started the company. Um, like Devoted has what we call our prime directive, which is the sacred standing order that guides everything we do. And the prime directive says this, when undertaking any action, when making any decision, visualize in your mind the faces of members of your family that you love desperately. And then ask yourself, if this action, if this decision would impact them, what would you do? Um, then open your eyes, right? And then go do the thing in the moment that you would do for your own mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your daughter, your son. Um, and uh, and if, 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 if one would think macroscopically, well, you know, what would you want for healthcare for your mom and dad? Uh, what everyone would want, right, is the best healthcare in the world, right? None of us would sell for anything less. And uh, best care in the world, as all of us in healthcare know, can be defined by, by a very precise algorithm, very precise formula, right? It is the right care, including very importantly, non-clinical support, delivered in the right place at the right time in a highly consistent, coordinated, proactive way. Um, and as all of us in healthcare know, like American healthcare infamously generally doesn't tend to roll that way, right? It is for a whole bunch of reasons, right? Um, Historically, unfortunately, incentive misaligned, information poor, uh, disorganized, confusing, fragmented, reactive, and non-prevention oriented. Um, but there are heroic local organizations like Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, or Caremore in Southern California, right, or ChenMed in South Florida, right, or Village Family Practice, right, in Houston, Texas, right, that through hero local heroics actually figured out a way to get people the right care, right place, right time in a highly consistent, proactive, coordinated way and demonstrate conclusively that two things happen when you do that, right? One, outcomes significantly improve and two, costs significantly decrease because they're two sides of the same coin, right? If someone has diabetes and congestive heart failure and hypertension, right? If you take fantastic proactive care of them and get them the right care, right place, right time, including non-clinical support, they both stay as well as possible and they don't go to the hospital repeatedly. Um, so devoted in a nutshell is combining the wisdom of the ages and the experience and learnings um, along those lines, combining that with what technology is capable of doing in the early 21st century um, to be a company engineered from the ground up to scale that kind of right care, right place, right time, best care in the world, the kind of care you want for your mom and dad. Everywhere. So Todd, do you feel if you get the mission right, you can get the other stuff right? It's about the purpose. Absolutely, I, I think that's absolutely right. You know, and uh, and I think that you know, um, um, it's getting the mission right, and then being unbelievably relentlessly focused on following that mission all the way through, right, and not making compromises along the way in the name of expediency, yeah. um, and. Um, uh, you know, like one of the benefits of being a middle-aged entrepreneur, right? Um, there are a few, <laughs> but one of them, right? Is that um, the level of access that Ed and I have now in our lives to human financial relationship, intellectual capital is several orders of magnitude greater than when I was 24 and he was 22. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, because to actually follow Devote's mission all the way through in an uncompromising way, right? The play you actually then run, right, is a play that is 100x easily more ambitious than Athena, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's, it's just it's just not a mission that Ed and I were capable of mobilizing the resources to do. Right. 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 You know. Um, but but now now we are, and he and I and now eight hundred of our closest friends at <laughs> Devoted. Um, we think of devoted as the great mission of our lives, the rest of our lives. And we also think of each prior experience we've had as both meaningful unto itself and also preparation to now do this thing. Um, without each of the experiences that I've had, that Ed's had, that all of our teammates have had, devoted would not be, would not be possible. Um, and uh, we have been able to assemble the resources, knowledge, experience, et cetera, to finally do this thing that we've been, I think whether we realize it or not, been dreaming about our entire lives. So Todd, we're, we're at the bottom of the hour. We've got a bunch of entrepreneurs who have hung on for an hour to listen to us. What advice would you give them? If you could tell them one thing, what would it be? Wow. Um, well, first I would say, God bless you. And thank you so much for digging into making healthcare better. Um, you are an incredibly powerful underlying reason why I believe American healthcare will keep getting better. Um, and this, this, I think the second thing I would say is that um, uh, really embrace your mission and via the power of your mission, uh, focus on building the superpower of persistence, of persistence. Like if I had to pick one feature in a teammate to have, and I could only pick one, it would be the literal inability to give up. The little inability to give up. Because changing healthcare is so hard, right? Uh, it's so hard and so difficult and it requires such iterative persistent action over such a long time frame, right? That it requires superhuman levels of endurance and persistence. Um, but I think there's a magical synergy here, um, which is um, uh, it's kind of reflected in one of Steve Jobs' uh, kind of great sayings, which is that what really powers great entrepreneurs is they can't stand the idea of the world not having what they are building. And so, you know, truly mission-driven entrepreneurs um, are the ones that have the most superhuman levels of resilience and endurance and persistence. Um, if people are in it for the stock options, like the 10th time they get punched really hard in the face and say, look, you know, there's a lot easier ways to make money in this world. I'm going to go do that, right? right. In it for the glowing write-up, right, in a, in, a, in a publication, right? The 15th time they get their femur snapped in half, they say, you know what, this is just too much pain, just not worth it, right? right. The people who are going to keep going Right, are the ones who cannot stand the idea of the world not having what they're building, right? Yeah. Who are yeah. fundamentally mission oriented. And my experience with those people is that they are unstoppable. They are terminatrixes slash terminators of unstoppable, <laughs> unstoppable forward movement, right? Um, and uh, they will get knocked down, and keep getting up, uh, knocked down, and keep getting up at a level that is way beyond what normal human would do. And that is, that is critical to actually ultimately building something that truly does dramatically improve our healthcare system. Um, so don't, don't give up, embrace your mission and you won't give up. Um, and God bless you and may the force be with you as you do the work that you are doing. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your attendance this afternoon and Todd, thank you so much. God bless everyone.